The art exhibit at CCC is a group of paintings done by an artist named Roberto Salas, who, born and raised in El Paso, Texas, currently resides in San Diego. Uh, he's also a visiting artist at the Museum of Art in Balboa Park in San Diego, where he's working on a number of really incredibly cool uh, public art projects. And along the way, he uses that studio, he paints in it. So these are a series of paintings um, that have political backgrounds, though they're, I wouldn't call them propaganda. And as a Chicano artist, which is uh, part European, part Native American, uh, he has concerns about how our politics have evolved in this country from uh, the Spanish conquistadors, you know, to, to right up to civil rights movement and so on. And so a lot of his paintings, even though they're beautiful and uh, painted in a, in a very painterly manner, uh, although quite thin in paint, um, they're, they're not like this overt propaganda about what went wrong or what's going wrong right now. And they're actually quite beautiful. And if you look at the paintings, you'll be able to see a number of images that continue to repeat. And one of those is ship forms. So it's like traveling in a vessel. And also those ship forms sometimes become butcher knives. So the evolution of those forms in the different paintings as you move through the show, you'd be able to kind of see like there is a sharp edge here. You know, this isn't just some wooden ship that's carrying humans across the sea. This is a knife that can cut, butcher, and kill. So um, I've known Roberto Salas now for, oh, 25, 30 years. And uh, we were both a little bit younger back in the day when we met. And uh, he knocked on my door. I was the director of galleries at the University of Texas at El Paso, sitting in my office. This dude knocks on the door. I open it up, and it's this guy. And he goes, I have a project that I need you to help me do. And I'm like, well, come on in here. Let's talk about this. And he had with him this attack dog. It was this German Shepherd that was the most vicious animal I've ever seen, except it was a Chihuahua. So it was literally this big... <laughs> this, oh, that was a funny dog. Anyway, um, so we one the project, what we did was uh, he made an arrangement with the... Uh, the people who run the bus benches in the city, and they have a, a, a vast public art transportation uh, machine there. And so there are bus benches all over El Paso, and everybody uses the buses there. And, and he told the people that he was going to do paintings on their bus benches, and they were totally into it. And so they were paintings about the Southwest, they were painting about politics, they were paintings about uh, imagery from history in of the area and so on and so Roberto would bring those bus benches into my studio and we would paint them I helped him uh, so I was his assistant I, I had nothing to do with making the art myself just assisting him and then we would deliver them to the bus people and they would put them all over El Paso so over the next 15 to 20 years it wouldn't surprise me if I go to El Paso today I still see some of them but like these bus benches were moving all over the city and every time they'd move the newspaper would do another article about it so it was like this ongoing PR machine for Roberto it was really interesting and fun huh. so that's how we met so you've known him for a long time so is that how he came to to have an exhibit here um I actually try not to have anything to do with that um obviously since I knew him and he's an extremely well-known artist with a huge reputation. Um, our budget doesn't allow us to recruit famous artists very often um, to have shows here or to lecture or speak. Um, that being said, on Monday of next week, we have the Yes Men coming to do a presentation, and they're huge too. But in the meantime, we can utilize people, our acquaintances and friends, to have good shows. And so it was proposed to Kate Simmons, our gallery director, that Roberto show and the gallery committee looked at the work and said, yeah, let's have him show. And then I called him up and said, we're going to have you show, and this is what we can afford, and do you want to do it? And he said, yeah. And then after that, I kind of was hands off. This material, a lot of the artists in Los Angeles have been using it in different places to paint murals. The convenience of getting these large sections of Pellon and putting them on the wall or the ground and working on them, laying your base colors or drawing what you want to draw in and getting them ready, rolling them up, getting them into categories and then taking them to the wall and doing a wall that big on the outside. Well, what it does, it cuts the installation time very easy. 
this works like, uh, like wallpaper. And what you use, you know, the acrylic has a binder, and the, and the binder is acrylic. It's just polymer medium with the, uh, with the pigment, and that carries the pigment. Well, if you take that polymer medium and you raise the viscosity of it into a thicker gel, it, it's, it's thick, it's like lard, you know, and you take that thing and you roll it up on the wall with a thick roller, and you take these things, and I'm, I'm going to handle these so that you can, you can see, because everybody wants to touch them, but you roll it up into a tight little roll, and you line up your level up on top, and you start from the top, and you start putting it down. And it'll, if you get a little air bubbles, you can work them out. You can work them out until you get that section completely done. Next, and then you paste the other stuff. You can go right over this material. So if I was going to install this thing, this thing would be moved. I'd put a little bit of that goo on the back. We called it goo because it is gooey. And just don't let that get into your hair right in here because, boy, taking that off, then <laughs> I would have to wear gloves and long sleeve because it goes everywhere. And then you just apply it and then put the same stuff on top. It'll stay there forever, forever. You need a jackhammer to get that thing off of there. But it melts right into the wall, which is very nice. Once I have it on the wall, I can go back and do some touch-ups. If I have to line up, I can overlay a tiny little bit. You won't even notice it. It's not noticeable because, again, unless you get really close to the mural, you're going to see something completely different than when you're maybe driving by or looking at it at a distance, that glance that one gets. It's an old saying, if you don't notice, if nobody points it out, you won't even notice it. So <laughs> if you think that jacket doesn't go well with your outfit, don't point it out. Just nobody will really notice it. It'll look good, you know? So that's sort of a policy that you have. So then from those large scale, I did one in America, Samoa, where we did a collaborative. and. Uh, it was in the entrance of a college, and all the college students got together, and two weeks we had a beautiful piece that was done collaboratively, and we thought about it right then and there, used some of the elements that they had there, and put it together. Now they're graced with a nice product, a beautiful mural that was done collaborative. And that's the key, is that collaboration of everybody working together to create one big unit. And it's, it's an engagement that involves and So now those guys know the technique. So it'd be interesting to go back later on and say, well, what else have you done with this? You know, whoa, hopefully they're using it in this scale. So I was, uh, so this, how this work came together, I had material, I understand how it works. I was given a studio space as a resident artist for the San Diego Museum of Art. And the main task there was to do two public art pieces, engage with the community. For instance, you could be a community here and I could say, okay, let's, this is our wall, what do you think we should go there? Somebody will say this, and we write it all down, and I filter it, and then I come up with an idea and say, how about this? Oh yeah, that's good, so then we do it together. Well, we've got a couple of those pieces going on. In the meantime, I get this studio space that's huge in this warehouse, and I haven't had a large studio space, so it calls for big work. So next thing I know is I'm pulling out this roll and I start putting a piece and stapling it up on top or whatever and start doing all the walls, same size. So I start mixing paint, and I said, well, maybe I'll take another route. So I started using coffee. You can see the evidence of the coffee in there. It's a great um, ground that you could use, for lack of words. Uh, you can go to collect coffee grounds. You can make a hot pot of coffee. You can get some instant stuff, you know, get the cheap stuff and boil the heck out of it. And it makes a great ground for drawings or washes. So I started throwing these, put some on the floor, put some on the wall, and just started throwing the coffee out. Um, that, this is another project. And, and uh, I've had this idea of how uh, I've been challenged. I work with scientists sometimes, and I've been challenged, like, what can you do to help humanity? What can you do to help this problem, this eco project? And I think all of us have that sort of consciousness of being uh, eco-concerned, for the back of a better word. I think we all have that conscious, especially younger people in this day and age. Uh, so uh, that challenge comes in from scientists saying, well, we have this problem with this particular species, and you know, this is something that's endangering it. And so you know, it, it poses a problem. But now along those lines, I was thinking, yeah, the, the importance of bees is incredible. And how, now you're hearing more of it, but years back, 
who knew what was going on and how important the pollination is in that whole idea. So I, uh, I wrote a grant to this Catalyst um, funding source. It's the San Diego Foundation. They have these foundations everywhere. So they're giving Catalyst grants to individual artists. And I think 140 applied, and I think 10 artists got it. Lucky me, I got one. But I pitched an idea, and the idea is this. Imagine if I could create a big sculpture of a bee and explode it a thousand times, large, good scale, put it on a stick like a lollipop. Uh, but OK, so you see a sculpture, but what's this sculpture made of? What if it was made out of uh, bird seed? You know, and do a nice organic, uh, gluten-free mix, you know, with... Uh, <laughs> with uh, the stuff, you know, and put it into a mold and pack the mold and the lollipop, once you pop the mold out, will be this beautiful bee made out of bird food, which will stay together with an internal frame and set that out in a garden and put a time-lapse camera on that. What it does, it's a physical, it's a physical, it's a physical metaphor for what's happening because the birds are going to come and eat that bee to the skeleton. And so what you're seeing here is something right in front of your eyes of the bees actually disappearing. And at least, hopefully, you'll start asking questions. And what's this? Sort of to activate the mind. They like the pitch. I got funded. I got a $20,000 grant, <laughs> which is uh, shared with, uh, with the uh, collaborating nonprofit, which is called Camarada. And they're a musical group. Here's the other thing. You know, the artist had to choose a nonprofit do you think any of the art institutions were interested in me? I got to chose, choose three. The other two said no, and the Music Institute, which was a long shot because I'm a street musician. I can't read music, but I do love music, and I like chamber music. And I figured, you know, these guys, well, they're the ones that got the hook and called me, and we wrote it together again and developed it, and we presented. So it's, it's not a lot of money, but it's a very honorable sort of position to be in. So now what I'm doing is I'm building these things, and they're going to be hosted by Balboa Park, uh, the airport, Scripps uh, Oceanography, and we're putting them in different places in town, and they'll disintegrate. But we can get to re refill them again and load them up, and hopefully there'll be other institutions. And a project like that could be done something like on this campus and work together or have people contribute. OK, we're going to have a bee exhibition in here while this is going on. And it's, a, it's an awareness thing. It's a, a, it's a nice, pleasant way than rather be on your face kind of awareness. So it seems like it, it has worked. So I'm working on that as well. <laughs> so, so anyway, this is how a lot of these paintings. But I make my living through public art. Uh, uh, and there's a lot of commissions out there, 1%, 2%. Uh, municipalities have this work. And as an artist, you have to find all kinds of angles because you, know, you just can't depend on one to sustain you. And uh, even if it's you're making t-shirts or you're going on a commercial route, it's, it's all good. You have to figure it out because you have to have money coming from different directions in order for you to sustain to do what you want to do. And what do I, what do I want to do? I want to make art. That's what I'm good at. That's my job. That's, I can't do anything else because that's what I do. And I've managed to do it all my life. And I also travel because that enriches my life. You know, if you can travel, you can go study abroad or figure out some way to take that history class that you're dreading, but do it in Italy. <laughs> For the money, it's worth it. You see, if you can get hooked up with something like that, oh my goodness, that's the way to do it. So, you know. Figure out a way that, let's say you're looking for a job and you're going to be a photographer. Even if you're sweeping a studio where they do photography, that, that's, that's where you want to be sweeping. You want to be sweeping in the studio where, if you want to be a printmaker, if you want to, that's, you've got to find something directed to what you want to do. And then make sure that you want to do it, because then you can see how things are run. There's some people that have gone into graphics and they've gone into, uh, Design studio, oh, I can't deal with the deadlines. Well, now you know. At least you saw what it takes, so you're not going to jump into something. But you have to be very resourceful and clever to sustain yourself as an artist. And the thing, of course, if you want to teach, you, can, you need to get that MFA so that in case you do, such as when the economy came down, and I've never seen it so worse in 2008, I felt it. It's like, whoa. But at the very least, you can go find a job and teach. So that's always a good thing to have. But continue, and, I, and, and you'll find that 
once you keep going and you start developing this work, other things spring out out of one thing. So, um, so anyway, these, these are uh, just direct works. Each one of these comes from a different series, like the flint. And if you not start noticing the shapes, of course, it's very canoe-like, very pod-like shapes, cocoons. That sort of comes, it's a re reoccurring. Uh, machetes, yes, uh, boats. Uh, and this series actually is a progression of an old world, new world series that I was working on with colliding the two cultures of my culture, the European and the native together and juxtaposing them together. Because if you compare like a steel, a steel weapon and a, and a stone weapon, there's a big history that goes on, you know, that really is a, it's conflicting at the same time as perhaps my personality, because I'm a makeup of both. You know, I have the European and then I have the native side, so it's like one other side pulls more than the other, you know, and it's this kind of weird composite that's going in. So uh, it's, a, it's a good way to, to develop it for me or to learn about it. Uh, this coffee painting here that you see here that's this map, it's a fictitious map that just sort of came out. But out of that, uh, somebody saw it, and there's a conservancy on Baja California, which is really beautiful. I encourage you to go see Baja California. It is an incredible place, incredible cactus, incredible desert and ocean, and it's absolutely beautiful, breathtaking if you like the outdoors, because that landscape down there is something else. Uh, but anyway, there's a conservative that's conservative missions and all sorts of history, and the guy came up and said, oh, Roberto, I love this piece. He said, do you think you could, we could commission you to do a map? And I said, well, I'm not really a map maker, but what do you need? And he says, well, we'd like to have in the cover of this book that's being composite uh, a picture of California as an island, or Baja California. Because when the Spanish came in, they thought that the whole California was a, an island because they saw the peninsula on both sides. And so there's these beautiful maps of California as an island. So they want to use it for their cover. I said, oh yeah, I can, I can do something like that. So I'm working on that. And, but it came out of spilling coffee on this just, just to see what would happen. And if you notice the edges when you get close, it looks like I took a torch to it. It's not a torch, it's just the coffee settling on the side of the pelon on the actual edge which is like, ooh, how did that come about? You know, that's, and those are the little surprises. I was talking to Dave's class today, this morning, and everybody's in a drawing class. This isn't the same class, is it? No, it's a different class. But you were in that class. Yes, I recognize her. Uh, the, the worst thing about drawing in there is this, that four-letter word, fear. Everybody's afraid of making mistakes. And in art, you have to make mistakes. You have to push the envelope. You have to do things. You have to really do things in order for, to you, for you to get a reaction or to, from the paper and the material that you're using. If you don't do it and you're, oh, well, that, that's OK. I'm done. I ain't going to cut it, especially with him. You know? <laughs> so you have to really push it. And in pushing it, what happens is that you yourself will be discovering things about yourself that you didn't know. Uh, you, uh, maybe a few of you know who Alan Capra is. He's the godfather, grandfather of performance art. Passed away. He was big in the 60s. Happens to be a mentor at UCSD. And he was telling me about his start with happenings and performances and things. He talked to John Cage, who was his master, and he said, you know, Roberto, all I needed to do is ask John Cage if I could have permission, to, if he would grant me permission to do this. It was some kind of permission I was after. And he said, by all means, guys, passed away, but he has, there's books written on Alan Capra, which everybody can look up, and he's well, world renowned as this humble gentleman that was just great to know to have known. I'm, I'm so pleased that that faculty was there at the time, but it's sometimes we just need the permission to say, yeah, go ahead, mess it up. If you don't mess it up, if you just deliver something blank, you don't grow, you don't learn anything. So. Get in there and, and drive fast. <laughs> you can speed in that class and you won't get a ticket. But uh, I think that those are the things you know, that I kind of try to advise students is to go ahead and experiment. Go ahead and make mistakes. You know, there's, it, it, good things come out from these things, which you can't do in a math class. And believe me, I know. I couldn't understand why as a kid I'd get these Fs and Ds. And I checked the problem five times. 
And I still get it wrong, and I still get an F, or I still get a D. Well, later on, I found out that 31 was looking like 13. Well, I'm dyslexic. So no matter how I check it, the answer was I was doing 31 instead of 13. And it was every time I looked at it, it's 31. And somebody said, no, that's 13. I said, what? So, you know, these, these, these things are calculated. Or you're looking for a formula. You know, the formula is to do the work. If he wants one piece, do another two pieces, see what happens. Ooh, you, you, you just, he'll love you forever. <laughs> but it's, it's the fact that you need to do more than one piece to know who you are, or what you're talking about, or what these materials are telling you. So there's you, and then there's the material. And the materials will just sit there until you actually manipulate them. So this is basically sort of in these lines. I manipulated these materials to see what would happen. I sandwiched them with plastic, put pressure on them, use iridescence. And the worst thing that can happen, if you don't like it, you could cover it up again and start all over again. But something will show up from that to say, oh, that's interesting, evidence or residue of a past, brush stroke. Nothing has to be perfect, because if you want perfection, we could use the medium. But remember that it comes to you, has a little heart, and then it delivered through the hand, or if you both hand, left-handed, right-handed, it comes out in both ways, you know, so. But it's, it's, it's and, and you know, it's, it's not necessarily reflects an art, it can reflect on any other subject, you know, and I think art will make people better students with other subjects. It kind of just balances you out in a sense that taking in, putting out, you know, it's a nice, and what Dave talks about, you know, I have tons and tons of sketchbooks because it's my security blanket. And I carry that security blanket with me and, you know, I got a little chance here, oh, I'll do a little drawing. Or what was I thinking? It's thinking out loud. Or how am I going to solve that problem of attaching this piece together with this? Mm, what do you think? Well, okay, I could. And it's all there and then I can always refer to it back. Some of the best ideas could be in your portfolio or little sketches. Or how am I going to set up that? Yeah, because everything relates to drawing. Everything that's in here is designed by somebody. The shoes you're wearing, your eyewear, your nice t-shirt. So check out this t-shirt here. Very subtle. Little design there, right? Somebody designed that. Somebody designed the shirt too, the fabric. Everything has come from some kind of a drawing. You know, so it, drawing is everywhere. It's in the architecture, it's, you know. Uh, another thing is mathematics. Even though I'm a dunce when it comes to math and writing, uh, I love math. There, I had a, a, an incident where I met uh, an artist. It was, to me, it was like meeting somebody grandeur, who was an Italian artist by the name of Mario Merz. And this artist adopted the use of Fibonacci number series. Anybody know the Fibonacci's? Yes, aren't they wonderful? And for those who don't know, Fibonacci is a number series that was developed by this man, young man who was Italian and went to Arabia to study mathematics. He came back with this method of taking one and one is two, two and one is three, three and two is five, five and three is eight, and it goes into these beautiful sequential numbers. And this artist uses him in his work, he's making a lot of neon. I happened to meet him and we had late dinner and lots of drinks and we're driving fast in his Fiat around Milano taking me to see his work and look at that one and there's one in the docks there on the Tower of Torino there's this Fibonacci number series in Eon. And just brilliant, and his drawings are free. He uses the igloo as shelter. If you look up this guy, he was fabulous. Anyway, he was part of the movement called Arte Povera, and Arte Povera means poor materials. So they were just gathering whatever uh, materials and creating installations. So, and one of my heroes, so I had dinner with him, lunch, and that whole entire week was Okay, tomorrow I'm showing here and I'll meet you there at 3 o'clock. So we'd go there and, of course, we'd wait for him. The phone would ring. I can't make it today, but tomorrow, Tuesday, meet me at this other place. It went like that the whole entire week. He, was just, he toyed and played with us. But every place he told us to go, there was an exhibit of his work. One of them was in an insane asylum that was just wild. He even paid the taxi, had the taxi, taxi come pick us up, take us to this place, wait for us for his call, and then the, we never saw him. The last stop was at his gallery, and the people were the Tucci Russos, and there are gallery people that still have connections to him. 
and he, she said, you're very fortunate that Mario took time to talk to you guys, but he told me to give you all these books, and uh, he's very busy, he can't see you again. So it was a whole week of just checking out exhibitions and, and seeing, so, I mean, how can, what a dream fulfilled to be actually sit in with him, talk, share work and conversation, and then the whole week see his work in different locations. It was like, wow, what a gift. Um, so that's where that tribute of using those numbers come from. It's a quotation, but they, they exist. Writing, text, whatever you can put into it. But it's been very exciting, and it's very nice to share these. So again, I thank you. And if you have any questions, I would gladly answer you or connect you with the best way to get that answer. It, it was a county building. Uh, it was strictly data to employees. And what happened is that I had designed uh, this piece based on what was there before. And this location was known for its Victorian architecture because of the railroad. So I proposed these tiles, large three by five tiles, of these details to, and that would be installed in this building. So I think the first thing that happened is they put a break on the project because people were screaming in Sacramento, we don't want another glass building, glass and steel. We want something that really relates. So what stayed was my artwork, and they changed the building and had a nice brick veneer with sort of influence that the artwork had and coloration. So it was really interesting that the artwork actually influenced the design of the whole entire building, because that stayed and the glass building went. So now you have this warm <laughs> connection to it. Back in the 90s, I was commissioned, and these are competitions. What you do is you submit work again, and if you get shortlisted, which means you are a finalist, you get an honorarium. It could be from $50 to $2,000 to develop a proposal. Once you develop the proposal, they call you in and you create a pitch. And the pitch is do the song and dance, you know, the whole thing, show the visuals, show the references, and why it is that you came up with this idea. And uh, once you do that, they, and they like you, then you get a contract. So I got a contract to do the metro station, which is right in Watts. Anybody? Heard of Watts? Mostly in the negative, I would imagine. But Charlie Mingus was born in Watts. Uh, Watts Towers, anybody heard of Watts Towers? Watts Towers is this beautiful place, very close to the station. But this, this Sam Rodea was this immigrant Italian man who bought this property in Watts at the time where he was working in Los Angeles as a mason. Uh, somehow this piece of property had this weird shape like a boat, like a canoe, and he built a little house on it. So every time he came home, he would pick up little dishes or ceramic or pieces of wire or glass and stuff and a little bit of concrete, probably from the job, a little bit of rebar or whatever, and he started building these towers. So what it really is, it's Marco Polo's ship. And these towers are structurally super strong and they go, and they're imbricated with concrete, steel, concrete, and then he put these little charts of coffee cups and plates and just to make it colorful and beautiful. So he built these three towers and there's pictures of him where he's hanging on there. And, and then he built a wall and he had a little house. The house burnt down, it's no longer there. But it just, I saw it as a young man. My sister-in-law took me to, to see him and it was like this magnificent, you know, folky kind of place that existed in, in Watts. Well, lo and behold, this station in this competition was right at 103rd Street Station, which is a few blocks away. And I said, this would be absolutely, what an honor to be, have a sculpture here next to Simon Rodea, you know? And I was just like, I gotta get this commission. I, only for the sheer experience of being connected to this man who I thought was wonderful. I mean, I love, but uh, the towers are still there. There's a foundation and they have a visitor center. Now there's a garden. The thing is just flourishing very nicely. So if you're in LA, check out the Watts Tower. It's very easy to get there. So anyway, this piece that I, Develop was I did some research and every work has to have research. You have to think about why and how it is that this is important to this area. So I found out after tons of research that there used to be uh, the big red car which ran on the same property, same right of way that they've got this new LA Metro that is up to capacity now. And they needed this years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, but it didn't happen. So when it did happen, they're using the same right of way and the station platform 
uh, was deserving of art. So the commission was $50,000. I uh, went and uh, made an, uh, did the formal application, got to be a finalist. I said, all right, I'm close. Got to figure this one out. But I found out that in the old red car, the conductors used to have a little chop. And so when I got your ticket for traveling, I could put the chop in and get the receipt and put it in the box. And later on, this chop, which was a design, there were over a thousand of these, they could identify, oh, that's John's, put it in John's pile, and that's Bill's. And so they would tally up what these guys were doing. So I saw these, I said, these are beautiful. They're somewhere abstract, some are kind of strange. So I figured, in honor of these towers that go up, I made these basic, very simple, totemic pieces of steel, and I cut out these shapes. Each shape of these towers have six shapes. And so there are the conductors honoring to the big red car, and we painted them red, even though it's the blue line. The piece is called Red Totems on the blue line, or Blue Line Totems on, in red, or something. To, I forget the titles. I got the commission. <laughs> I got the commission. I got to build it. So that was 1991. Uh, a couple months ago, I got a call, <laughs> and they're <laughs> and they're saying, "Hey, we're ext we've extended the the the, uh, the the platform, and we'd like to recommission you to uh, move two sculptures." <laughs> I said, "Move two sculptures?" I said, "Yeah, yeah, we're we need to move them to another to the, a little further down." And any anything else? They said, "No, just that," you know. So I said, "Oh, okay." So they recommissioned me again, but a little more money than I got the first time to do this project. So interesting enough, you know, there's, there's work to do on pieces that you've done before because either they need to be restored or redeveloped or changed. And so there is a life after this public art pieces are done, which is kind of interesting and, it, and good that they're caring for it because once they're restored and take, they'll last, they'll outlive me which is really nice, you know, I, I like that aspect of, of this work. Um, I think maybe I'm excited with the map now because maybe it's, it's going to go fulfill a use where it really didn't have, like, it just came out of, just out of experimentation and seeing where I could do with the coffee, so maybe that one, I don't know. <laughs> it's just, uh, you know hopefully we can get it into something that'll be distributed out there. That, I, I, I'm excited about that. Yeah. It's always an honor to be on a book cover, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Yes, that's, that's good. Well, this piece over here, what it is, it's actually a proposal, a kind of big scale proposal, because I have a lot of drawings. But what it is, it's me thinking about creating a chain link fence boat for a park so that you could actually walk. And then and, uh, in the back part over here, you would have some kind of a entryway and you'd probably be about that scale, and you could actually walk into it and close the door behind it, made out of ch chain link fence with the ribs of the boat coming out, and you'd see it up on top, and you'd walk to the bow, and then, you know, check it out, and then go back and open the little gate door in the back, and, and I just priced that uh, through a chain link company, and it would probably cost me about like $5,000 to do that piece, but I think it would be really worth it to actually be able to do it in, in a garden or some place where it would be in public space. So that's, that's where they come. It says chain link boat, I think, or chain link canoe or something. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not detailed in that sense. It's just kind of thinking out loud. And, but then again, it could be, it could be a sculpture. It could, it could change. It has a metamorphosis of changing or using for different. This, this one that you see here, I was going up uh, in Thailand, and I was going up river. And it's so fascinating because uh, you know, people's technology in different countries always fascinate me. They, they have full V8 engines on these canoes. And what they do is that the engine's on a pivot. It's the whole entire engine. And then the shaft is the propeller. So when they push down on this lever here, the propeller goes up when they pull it up like this, and they can shift. They almost have a, some of them, of course, are automatic, but it's just, 
the throttle is the drive shaft of the whole entire motor, and you're going trumping it. We saw this, and it was all made out of steel, which is kind of weird. I don't know if it was left from military or, but it was kind of abandoned and still floating, and, but it had this weird presence there. I, I remember that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your time.